the presence of a wrestling legend. Oh, come on, everybody. Let's give a big ho, guys. Ho! That's some good hoeing. <laughs> there we go. Oh, my goodness. What an honor to ho, ho, ho with you here well, in you. Aberdeen. First of all, another round of applause. WWE Hall of Famer Hacksaw oh, Jim Duggan you. in Aberdeen, uh -huh. Scotland. Oh. How cool is that? Actually, my fourth trip to Aberdeen. Wow. You know, uh, in, the, in the old days, the WWF, we came here a couple times. And then I came here just about 10 years ago and worked at the uh, ballroom with a local company here. Wow. And this is our fourth trip. I brought my wife with us. We're going to spend an extra uh, few days and see the country and, and enjoy Aberdeen. And the folks, thank you for being so welcoming. It's been a great time here so far. Yes, it's a lovely group of people, and Aberdeen's beautiful. Do you try to make time to see uh, wh where you go in your travels? I'm sure WWE and different wrestling promotions and appearances take you all over the world. Well, that's the deal. And back in the old days with WWF, you'd wrestle all the time, even though I did, I, as, as many guys, we wrestled uh, 30 different countries, every state in the Union, every province in Canada, but you never saw nothing. You saw the airport, the hotel, and the arena, and maybe the gym. <laughs> so now at this point in my life, I, I just turned 69 years old, wow. and me and the wife, we sit, spend time and, and get to know, uh, smell the roses a little bit when we fly to a country like this and, and stay and enjoy the people. So wonderful. Well, guys, if you're just joining us, wow, look at this turnout. Amazing. If you're just joining oh. us, we... Oh. <laughs> Sometimes they just pop out of me. You just I never can't. know. We're on, we're on high alert. We've got a microphone over here on the left and a microphone on the right. So please don't be shy. Come up and ask a question after I'm done marking out, as we say in professional wrestling. Because there's been a lot of wrestling cosplay here. So I know my wrestling peeps are, are milling around and they're excited for this one. What is it like to see someone cosplay as Hacksaw Jim Duggan? Oh, that's great. Of course, my character, I, I didn't have, a, like, Macho Man, you know, he had all the hats and the jackets, yeah. and, the, you know, I've got a two-by-four and the flag. So <laughs> I, I wrestled in a pair of uh, short shorts and patent leather boots. It was kind of tough. But uh, so it's fun to see folks dressed up like that. And, of course, like the action figures, when the action figures first came out, that was quite a thrill. You know, people say, Hacksaw, I got your doll. <laughs> I said, they're not dolls, they're action figures. But... But it was great to have stuff like that come out. And, you know, that's one thing a lot of folks don't appreciate is the appeal of professional wrestling around the world. You know, in America, I do a lot of charity events with the NFL, the American football people. And they're like, well, we're world champions. I'm like, where in the world do you fellas go? Uh, wrestling, we go all over the world. And wrestling fans are great all over the world. Yeah. They sure are. Great way to put it. And again, an inexpensive cosplay option. You just needed an American flag. Yeah. A, a plank of wood and a <laughs> pair of trunks and you got it. Yes. And you're set. You're totally set. Well, I mean, you have had so many amazing accomplishments uh, in, in your illustrious career. But being a WWE Hall of Famer, uh, your class of 2011, what was that experience like being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame? Well, th that's great. And no matter what profession you're in, to be recognized by your peers is very, very important. And to be inducted in the Hall of Fame by uh, Ted DiBiase uh, was, was quite a thrill, a highlight of my career. And, of course, any of the second-generation wrestlers, guys like Ted DiBiase, Jake the Snake Roberts, Kurt Henning, the Von Erichs, who grew up in the business, they were just that more polished in wrestling. So I wrestled Ted DiBiase thousands of times all over the world and learned an awful lot from Ted because I, I didn't start wrestling until I was 25. And Ted was in the ring when he was 15, yeah. so it's a learning curve, too. I remember uh, some of my favorite parts of, say, a Royal Rumble, which what I love about the Royal Rumble, and if you guys are, are wrestling fans or not, even if you're not a wrestling fan, do you agree that the Royal Rumble kind of brings out the fun in everyone? Because it's, you know, it's very constant, someone's running out. But when you come out, and, and as, as that legendary aspect of it, that's got to mean a lot to you, for the, the pop that you get from the fans, myself included. No, it's a, a very exciting of course. That's the, the biggest feather in my cap, because you know people say, well, Hacksaw, you were never world champion. You're never tag team champion. You're never intercontinental champion. I said, I was lucky to win a match. <laughs> <laughs> but I did win the first ever Royal Rumble. And that's the, the biggest feather in my cap. And I tell you, nobody was more surprised in that building than me to win that thing. <laughs> but I have me, myself and Shawn Michaels are the only two guys that have appeared in three decades of Royal Rumble, wow. something I'm really proud of. Because in the WWF, which was my heyday, I wrestled Dusty, DiBiase and Orton, 
But then in the WWE, I wrestled Dusty's kid, DiBiase's kid, Norton's kid. <laughs> First I beat up the old man, <laughs> then I beat up the kid. Ho! <laughs> Just spanning the generations of ass kicking. Love it so much. Yeah, that's the craziest thing is you're seeing a lot of second and third generation wrestlers. I mean, even The Rock is, they, is one. They, you sure do. And a lot of third gen, like you said, third generation. You know, I have two daughters and... Thank goodness, neither, neither one of them wanted to be wrestlers. <laughs> it's a tough life for a man. It's extremely hard for a woman, as yeah. you know, Val, because, you know, you forget your family life, forget holidays, forget birthdays. You're on the road an awful lot. You're traveling an awful lot. So it's a big sacrifice. So a lot of people that have the physical attributes and can talk on camera still can't handle the travel. So it's a, a unique combination of what it makes to be a professional wrestler. Yeah, for sure. And I think people forget, too, that it, it is a lot of sacrifices. And uh, it's, it's a really tough business. A lot of rejection, too, when you're coming up on the ranks there. And a lot of folks don't realize how competitive wrestling is. Yeah. You know, if they say, I want to be a wrestler. Well, I say, chase your dreams, because who would have ever thought Daniel Bryant would be a star? Right. You know, I saw that guy. He's about this big. I'm like, he ain't going to make it. <laughs> But there's a guy who had the drive, the desire, the work ethic, and became a huge popular star. So chase your dreams. But if you look at it as a businessman, I tell kids there's 1,200 NFL football players. There's 500 NBA basketball players. There's 100 WWE wrestlers. It's a television show. Yeah. It's actually more competitive than sports, but people don't see it that way. Yeah. And, of course, it's just not kids from America. you got kids from Japan, Australia, Europe. It's a very, very competitive business. And, of course, one of the big misconceptions is people go, well, you guys are all good friends, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yeah, we all compete for the same money. We're real good friends. <laughs> sure. it's, it's, a, it's business. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog business. And as you said, no off-season. So you talk about the NFL and different things. There's no off-season. No I mean, off how, how many days on the road were you, would say, in, uh, in, in the heyday? Yeah, uh, my longest run was 54 days straight, which was a lot. But look, many guys were up over 100 but, you know, folks, it's been a, a great business for me. Everybody hears the stories about my good friend Jake the Snake Roberts or, or Scott Hall, hear all the horror stories of professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in it for over 40 years. I've been with my wife for 38 years. I never had to go to rehab for booze or drugs. I said, no felony arrest. <laughs> a couple misdemeanors, but that was the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> That's the 80s. But it's been a great business for me. I put two daughters through school. So there's a lot of success stories in professional wrestling, Tito Santana, yeah. some other guys, but you never hear, you always hear the train wrecks, yeah. but there's positive stuff too. Yeah. And there's so many reasons to look up to a legend like you, uh, even for a little girl like me wanting to be in, in a big wrestling production and, and doing my homework and watching all of the, the golden era, as they called it. And I, from that era, I mean, I got a chance to work with Macho Man Randy Savage, and I've you know, worked with Mr. Hogan and Mr. Flair and all of those guys. What do you think was so special about that particular era that, that you were so Yeah, that was just kind of like a moment in time in Hollywood with Jimmy Stewart and yeah. John Wayne. It just happened to be a time, and it was a, a great, lucky for me to be part of that generation of guys. I think nowadays the kids are actually more athletic than our generation, mm. but I think our generation was more creative. You know, uh, no writer gave Hacksaw Jim Duggan his verbiage. Right. You know, it, uh, you just were, you, you were who you are. Yeah, kind of learning as you go. That was yes, certainly yeah, the case uh -huh, even for me uh -huh. back in the day. And, you know, if, of all the things I've done, i got to tell you folks, the, the biggest moment in my career, you know, I'm from a small little town in upstate New York called Glens Falls, about 200 miles north of New York City. And as a kid, my dad would drive me and my three older sisters down to New York City to Madison Square Garden to the circus. So you can only imagine I had my dad with me to drive into New York City in front of Madison Square Garden and see Hacksaw Jim Duggan versus Andre the Giant. You know, it was a double whammy. Great to be main event at the Madison Square Garden, but to be in there with Andre the oh Giant, uh, it was a whole nother thrill. Oh my gosh, history indeed. We have a couple uh, people coming up for questions. There's a mic over there on the left and over here on the right. We have a question for you, sir. And all questions are fair except math questions. No math questions. No math, <laughs> if you guys don't mind, please. But there's a question over here on the right. Hello, sir. Hello, hey, buddy. Um, who would you like to face from the modern wrestlers, um, maybe back in your heyday? Like, who, who would you have wanted to face? Maybe well, AJ Styles, you mentioned Daniel Bryan, like anyone like uh, that? Well, yeah, Daniel Bryan. Well, uh, Kevin Owens, I was surprised. And, of course, The Rock. I, I like to joke, you know, I, I worked with The Rock's uh, grandfather, High Chief Peter Maivia. Yeah. I worked with The Rock's father, Rocky Johnson. 
And I make it to Rock at WrestleMania. Ho! Yes. No chance in hell. <laughs> we, we can dream. Great question. Thank you so much. Obviously a huge Rock fan, a huge Austin fan. I mean, there's so many iconic Austin, characters. wait a minute. Whoa. I think he was stunning Steve Austin. I beat him so bad he had to shave his head and change his name. <laughs> the hair never I came back. I beat the hair off the boy's head. <laughs> <laughs> you sure did. Now, who do you think nowadays, we're talking about modern wrestling, you know, WrestleMania is coming up as well. Uh, and by the way, for those of you that are uh, Monopoly events uh, fans, as you are, that you're here, we have For the Love of Wrestling coming up in Manchester. That's at the end of April, where Daniel Bryan will be. But whether it's Daniel Bryan or AJ, as, as he mentioned, who are some of the stars of today that are really sticking out to you as, as the next big thing? Well, actually, I, I, I don't watch uh, too much wrestling nowadays. You know, I said after 45 years, the last thing I want to watch on my days off is wrestling. Wrestling. Yeah. But uh, some of the, uh, I just did the Chris Jericho cruise. Oh, yeah. And uh, Jericho, the uh, uh, Rock and Ranger cruise, I believe it's called. Yeah. And, it's, of course, Chris is on the level of Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, I believe. Chris I Jericho is a huge star. But I did run down on the Billy Guns kids and hit them with my two-by-four and did the scissors. So <laughs> I'm following a little bit. I love that. It's so cool. And, again, going to that second generation. The first generation wasn't enough for you. It's the third generation. <laughs> third generation. There you go. My goodness. They said, Hacksaw, we want you to run down and hit the kids with a two-by-four. I said, how about if I walk real fast? <laughs> A nice healthy sprint. How was that, by the way? So I was on, I think it was the first Jericho cruise or the second. How was that to see wrestling on a moving cruise ship? Crazy, well, right? Well, back in the old days, WCW had the Bruise Cruise. And, yeah, we used to do the Bruise Cruise. And Crazy. it's a great time. It's a good chance to interact with the fans. And, of course, it's a cruise. Yeah. It's a nice excuse to have a little vacation for <laughs> sure. And I agree. Huge. Any, any Chris Jericho fans in the crowd? Yes. Yeah, Jericho yeah. is awesome. We have a question over here on the left. Hello, sir. Hi, Hi buddy. Um, do you have one fight in your entire career that you'd say, or like one fight, one match that you'd see is like your magnum opus, your best ever? My best ever match. Uh, that, that's that's kind of tough because I really wasn't a technical wrestler. You know, people say, Hacksaw, what's your favorite move? I said, I kick and punch. <laughs> I, I'm a brawler. I'm not a wrestler. But uh, me and DiBiase had a match in Sam Houston Coliseum in Houston, Texas. It was a loser leave town inside a steel cage with a coal miner's glove on top of a 10-foot pole, dressed in tuxedos. <laughs> so it was oh, yeah. a gimmick match of gimmick matches, so that one really sticks out in my memory. Nice one, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, That's thank you. That's a lot of gimmicks all at once. Why the tuxedos? <laughs> oh, we had a best-dressed man contest, oh. and so it led, it led, and of course, back in the Mid-South territory, a lot of Hall of Fame guys came through Mid-South because it was a great wrestling territory. So that whole angle fit together. There was a reason we had the coal miner's glove. There was a reason we were in tuxedos. There was a reason we were in a cage. Great wrestling. Yeah, everything meant something back then. Very important. All fit together. Yeah. We've got a question over here from this Young lovely God. gentleman. Hi, um, who was the person to fight? Who was the first? The, the best person to fight? No, the hardest person oh, to beat. Oh, your the toughest The hardest opponent. person to fight. There's no question about that, buddy. Seven foot two, 500 pounds, Andre the Giant. And I tell you, if there's a giant in our business, from Kali to Big Show to Andre to Yokozuna, they're like, Duggan, get your two-by-four. <laughs> I have to wrestle every giant there is. Yeah. I'll tell you. But it was great. You know, I wrestling Andre the Giant, that elevated me. We did our Saturday night main event show. was our prime show back in the day. And Andre stomps on down to the ring, and he's standing in the middle of the ring. He's like, I challenge anyone. They're like, Duggan, get your two-by-four. You know? oh, no. <laughs> so I got my two-by-four, and I run down to the ring, and I got my chin on Andre's belly. I'm looking up at him. I'm like, I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> 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 and he went to grab me, and when he did, his thumb hit my lip and knocked my lip right off. But Andre's got me by the throat. Now blood is cascading down my chest. It's pouring down my chest. And Andre's got me by the throat. He's choking me down. He's choking me down. He's choking me down. I feel around, I get my two by four, wham, I hit the big giant between the eyes. He goes down like a huge redwood tree. WWF goes off the air, me standing over Andre the Giant covered in blood. Ho! Oh! And, and that elevated me from a mid-card guy to a main event guy. And that was a huge favor Andre the Giant did for me. Because if he didn't want to do it, he would have ate my two by four. <laughs> 
And quick fangirl question from me before we get to our questions to the left. Can you explain the origin of the two by four? Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the two by four, you know, back in the old days before the, the uh, sports entertainment. Now it's wrestling sports entertainment. In the old days, back in the early 80s, if you think it's fake, you come up in the ring and you try one of us. You sign the waiver. And so, folks, you'd have to fight every local tough guy. And just getting back and forth in the ring was dangerous if you were a bad guy. And going out to your car, all the heels, all the bad guys would walk out to their car together because the people, they hated your guts. You beat up Ricky Mort, you son of a gun. You know? So anyway, just getting, like I said, back and forth in the ring was, was dangerous. People would spit at you and punch you and kick you, you know. So I'm in like West Texas, L Lubbock, uh, Texas, out in West Texas, all covered, sitting in the back of the dressing room, all covered with loogies, loogies and bruises <laughs> from the fans, rethinking my career choice, you know. <laughs> and Bruiser Brody, my mentor, comes in. He goes, Duggan, he says, if you carry something to the ring, carry something you can use. Forget those feathered boas and sequin robes. So I'm sitting back in this old nasty wrestling room. I look down, I'm like, well, Here's a piece of wood. <laughs> and I came out yelling, waving that piece of wood. It was like part in the Red Sea. Then people scattered. Yeah. I got to the ring. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> but one time I got this big, real big, nasty splinter in my thumb, you know, really bad splinter. And I went, ho, ho, ho. No. <laughs> That's a wrestling joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That be, might be a nice uh, memoir title for you. Loogies and Bruises. Loogies and Bruises. The story <laughs> of Axel Jim Duggan. We've got a question from the champ over here. Give it up for the champ, hey, everybody. Guy, right. he, I saw that belt. Yes. Beautiful belt. What was it like winning the first ever Royal Rumble? Well, that first Royal Rumble, like I said earlier, nobody was more surprised in the building than me. We got to the show. And of course, it was, I think it was in Ohio, and they have the board there where you read in when you're going in and when you're going out of the Royal. And of course, uh, that was a whole new concept, the, bat or the Royal Rumble, where guys would come down, I think it's every two minutes. Because yeah. I've done a lot of battle royals, but nobody had ever done the Royal Rumble before. So I'm looking down, I'm like, Duggan, 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 Duggan. I, I win? <laughs> so I was more surprised than anybody, but I'm in the ring. I'm all beat up from what Dino Bravo, the world's strongest man from Quebec, and one man gang, they were beating the devil out of me. Finally, uh, Dino went out, and I'm laying up against the ropes. Big one man gang, probably 400 pounds. He comes charging after me. All I did is I fell down, I grabbed the top rope, and big one man gang went over the top. And I, I won the first ever Royal Rumble. And like I said, young man, that's the. Uh, the biggest feather in my cap and, and something I'll always remember, that's for sure. Thank you for asking that, pal. As we do, yes. You have to be resourceful in a Royal Rumble. Pardon? You have to be resourceful in a Royal yes, Rumble. Win yeah. by any means possible, yeah, right? Whatever it takes. And, uh, what you try to do is stay out of everybody's way. Yeah. <laughs> Let have everybody have else fight. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be over here if you need me. We have a question over here on the left. Hello. So Hi. if you could fight in a Royal Rumble with absolutely anyone who isn't a wrestler, real or fake, who would it be and why? What's the question now? So if you could fight in a Royal Rumble with absolutely anyone, but they're not a wrestler, they can't not be a wrestler. Not a wrestler? Yeah, real or fake, you know, from TV, movie, etc. Et who would uh, you fight and why? Can it be, an old, can it, can it be deceased? Yeah, deceased. I want story. John Wayne in the ring. Me and the Duke are going after it. <laughs> Brilliant answer. I love that. Great question. Thank you so much. Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Good, yeah. <laughs> what, just John Wayne? or It's the Royal Rumbles. You can have as many oh, as you like. Uh, you yeah, there's a, a list of guys. Who else do you want to beat up? Just an entire list. Oh, um, Goldie Hawn? <laughs> no, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know, because Royal Rumble, that's, of course, back in the day, you know, even because my, my eyes were very, very bad, I had to wear really thick glasses, I've had them fixed, and even after uh, uh, WrestleMania 3, which was 93,000 people, Pontiac Silverdome, largest indoor crowd for any event, I came back from the ring and everybody's like, Duggan, how's the crowd out there? I'm like, well, without my glasses, the first three rows are full. <laughs> I don't know how the rest of the crowd is, but, yeah, then Royal Rumble, there's so much going on, you really couldn't see who was out there. But, guys, yeah, uh, my generation would be guys like uh, John Wayne and, yeah. of course, uh, uh, Lee Majors, Henry Winkler, yeah, the old-timers, yeah, man. Lee Majors, yeah. You could take them. You could take them. Great yeah, question. don't pull a hamstring getting off this quick. <laughs> <laughs> pull a we got a question again here on the left. Hi, Hi there. Hello there. I realized that you were drafted into the Atlanta Falcons, and obviously knee injuries prevented that, but what position were you going to be playing? What position did the Falcons 
Oh, yes. I was an offensive lineman for the Atlanta Falcons. Actually, I had a great high school career in my little town. I won the New York State Wrestling Championship. I was undefeated. Uh, my shot put record still stands today, almost 50 years since I graduated high school, and football was my main sport. So I was highly recruited by different colleges throughout the country, but I ended up playing my college ball for a, a Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, and I met Fritz von Erich. And Fritz came up to me, goes, kid, you want to be a wrestler? You look like you'd be a good wrestler. And I'm like, nah, I'm going to be playing in the NFL for 10 years. So I went to the Atlanta Falcons. I got hurt my rookie year. I had two knee surgeries. I went up to Canada. I played with the Toronto Argonauts in Canada for a while. Realized as an offensive guard I had no long-term future. I called Fritz von Erich up, who gave me the huge gift of professional wrestling. Because back then, if you weren't somebody's kid, you didn't get into wrestling. You weren't DiBiase or Jake. So it was a huge gift for him to open up the door for me for wrestling. And uh, that's how I got in. Thank you. Thank well, you. Of course. Great question. We have a question over here on the right. Hi, Kevin. buddy. Oh, I recognize this young guy. Who was your favorite person ever to fight? My favorite guy to fight was uh, the million dollar man, Ted DiBiase. Because as we were talking earlier, a second generation guy, he grew up wrestling. So I could learn an awful lot from Ted DiBiase. He was a great wrestler. And of course, it was a great promo. I said, Ted DiBiase may be the greatest technical wrestler in the sport. But he can't fight a lick. And if you're in there with a hacksaw, it's a fight. Ho! Oh, come on, guys. Ho! It's a Comic-Con. <laughs> Great question, buddy. Thank you. We've got one over here on the left. Hi. Um, so with wrestling fans nowadays, it's all about the Mount Rushmore of wrestling. Who would your Mount Rushmore be for wrestling? Who would your Mount Rushmore be? My Mount Rushmore Ooh. of all time, you mean? Yeah. I, I, I'm a Hogan guy. I like Hulkster. I, I've got along with a guy for many, many years. He gets more bad press than anybody I know. But, uh, you know, Hogan's Hogan. I joke, I said, I'll be getting off the airplane, and people are like, it's Hacksaw Duggan. Hogan will be behind me like, get out of the way, Hacksaw. It's Hulk Hogan. <laughs> so Hulkster's Hulkster. And, and Flair, those guys are on a different level, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. Sure. And what Hogan, what an amazing guy. What a nice guy. He's, he's get, guy gets more bad press I than know, anybody. I know, it's crazy. And what's funny is uh, people always say the bigger the star, the nicer they are. The Flares, the Hogans, lovely people to they, chat with. They are. Yeah, a lot of folks are jealous of him, and you know, yeah. and, uh, but uh, he's been a good friend of mine. Well, not a good friend, but a friend for 40 years. Yes, love him. We have a question over here on the right. The, uh, this is actually, hi, my, uh, my name's Ian. Um, it's a question for both of you. Who did you, um, the wrestling, did you enjoy? look forward to working with most? Like promotion-wise, fighting, etc. Promotion-wise? Yeah. So uh, promotion-wise, of course, uh, the WWF was the big one. I mean, but it was an awful lot of work. Like I said, you're working all the time. You had very few days off. So though it was great for your career, it was great to make money, it was a hard place to work. Yeah, it was uh, actually, I mean, like, personality-wise, was there someone you say, oh, I'm, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to yeah, be yeah. like Hogan or DiBiase. Like, oh, great. I'm, I'm, I'm fighting with him or I'm on a promo with him. Oh, yeah. I, I enjoyed working with anybody. Once you get to this level, uh, you're working with the best talent in the world. Because like I said, it's a very competitive business to get one of those 100 spots. So no matter if you're in there with Jake, DiBiase, Dino Bravo, Tito Santana, you know you're getting in there with one of the best guys there is. And the guy is not really your opponent. He's your partner, so you want to put on a good show. If we're wrestling together and we're main event and you hurt me, we're both out of the main event. So I want to take care of you and you want to take care of me. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, when I was started watching around, I want to say, 98 or so, it was WWF. It wasn't even WWE yet, and then there was no Impact Wrestling or TNA, as I still call it, uh, until later. And then I was there for nine years, great company. Another thing, but being in the UK, working with WOS that was on ITV, that was a really big deal for me to be on commentary with someone like Stu Bennett. As far as meeting someone, I want to take up your time. Kurt Angle, I think, was a huge one for me. Uh, loving Triple H, Stephanie, and Kurt's storyline especially. So to meet Kurt Angle, who another great, lovely guy, huge, famous. I don't know, if, I know Kurt lovely. a little bit. We, of course, we did that blockbuster movie, me and Kurt. I don't know if you all saw it. Yes. 
pro wrestlers versus zombies. I was in it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, right, I you didn't were, even yeah, know. Yeah. I didn't even know. And people talk. I said, I wasn't yeah. in the movie. It's because I was. It's a bad dancing. movie. Yeah. <laughs> so the Oscars are not going to be calling us for that one, no. No. Well, no. I nailed the part. I played <laughs> Hacksaw Duggan. <laughs> you played it so convincingly too. But, you know, one thing talking Thanks, about guys. different promotions, brother. You know, working for Vince McMahon. You know, I just did a talk show with a young guy. He's like, that Vince McMahon, he treats us like pieces of meat. I'm like, well, son, what do you think you are? <laughs> you want a friend? Go buy a puppy. You know, Vince is your boss. He's not your friend. So you're going to work for the man, and sooner or later, there will be a flushing sound. Yeah. Welcome to the big leagues. That always strikes me as very odd when people kind of come up and talk to you about, like, someone that you worked for. Like, for me, it was a Dixie thing. Oh, well, she was like this. And I, when Hogan and Bischoff came in, they did this and that. And I was like, I don't remember seeing you in meetings or anything. Like, where were you? It's so odd. We've got a question over here on the left. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, who is your uh, um, most favorite wrestler you fought? Favorite wrestler. Favorite wrestler, I think, again, uh, DiBiase, though. I enjoyed working with, with Ted an awful lot. And, of course, Jake the Snake. I traveled with Jake quite a bit. I'll have to tell you guys a, a quick little Jake the Snake story, you know, because uh, 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 we were working in Chicago, the Rosemont Horizon. Jake and I were tag team. We were the last match. And by the time we took a shower and everything, we go to leave, and there's this whole bank of doors. So we go to open the doors, and there's still probably 200 people out there, and they're all excited, and you can see the limo on the far side of the people. So we pull the doors closed, and Jake's like, you know, what are we going to do, hacker? I said, brother, one, two, three, we'll open the door, we'll fight our way through the people, I'll meet you at the limo. He goes, I'm, I'm with you, brother. <laughs> so one, two, three, we open the door, Jake goes out, I pulled the door closed behind him. <laughs> I gave him a five count. I snuck out. Nobody saw me. <laughs> I sneak all around sitting in a limo waiting for Jake. Yeah. How mad was he when he got to the Oh, limo? well, he got me back, let me tell you. <laughs> but Receipt. that's one thing. If you travel with Jake, that means you have to travel with Damien, the 100-foot or 10-foot, uh, 100-pound python. You know, and I got used to travel with Jake all the time, but it was a tough life for the python because he'd keep him in a duffel bag, and he'd be in the back seat. And the snake would always try to get out of the bag. He'd always try to get out of the bag. Anyway, we're driving to this town like in Mississippi, and Jake and I were late. <laughs> Imagine Jake and I being late for a show, right? <laughs> but we had a great theory. If you're going to be late, be so late that they're happy to see you. <laughs> Thank God you made the show instead of where the devil you been. But anyway, so I'm driving down the road. I got a big red in the Lincoln Continental. I'm flying. Jake's sitting next to me. The snake's in the back seat trying to get out of the bag. Boom, snake gets out of the bag. I'm driving down. I look up in the mirror. There's a giant snake head over my shoulder. Oh my God. Felt like Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> and people are like, well, it's a python. They're not poisonous. I said, no, but it's got a mouth like this. It'll definitely bite you, right? So we're going down the road. I slam on the brakes, and we go slide into this restaurant with all the kids out playing and the folks in their rocking chairs rocking. We go, ah! We come screeching in. Jake and I jump out of the car. We open the back door. We grab the snake. We're fighting with the snake. Stuff it back in the bag and drive off. <laughs> so you know to this day, people are going, you're not going to believe it? <laughs> These two guys had a giant snake in the back <laughs> sure of the car. Sure they did. I bet no one believes them. That's hilarious. We have time for maybe two more questions. Then we've got to get uh, Mr. Duggan back to the autograph area. So did you guys have questions over here? No, oh, the, oh, don't be shy. We've got, oh, here's a question coming up. Gingerly coming up. Recognize this young man. There we Hello, go. buddy. Um, obviously, you're in the Hall of, <coughs> Hall of Fame, but who, who else do you think deserves to be in the Hall of Fame? Great question. Who else deserves to be in the Hall of Fame? Oh, I think there's a lot of guys. Demolition, yeah. Bill and Barry Darso, everybody remembers the Demolition. Actually, we did a big tag at SummerSlam the one time I painted my face. You know, they made an action, different action figure. I said, I wish I'd known that. I painted my face every other day. But Bill and Barry, the demolition, uh, one-man gang, who was Akeem also, I think he should be in. Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of guys who be in, but I have no control over that, that's for sure. Thank you so much. Great questions, everybody. Final question from me. You know, we meet a lot of people here that are aspiring actors or filmmakers. If there are any aspiring wrestlers in the crowd, and actually there are a lot of independent wrestlers that are over there working, what advice would you give to them? Well, as we were talking early, because, you know, Daniel Bryan, I saw that guy, he walked in, small, you know, there's no way this kid's going to make it. 
He walked out in front of the crowd. Yes, yes, yes. The building blew the roof off. I'm like, there's a guy. So chase your dreams because who would ever thought a guy with a two-by-four would work? You know, you don't know what's going to work. So and also, I tell the young guys, feel free to change your gimmick up and find a gimmick that you're comfortable with. You know, obviously, I wasn't going to be handsome Jimmy Duggan, <laughs> so I had to come up with something. So I started off as Big Jim Duggan, and then I wore a mask, and I wrestled as the convict for a little while. And then I wore a fur, and I wrestled as Wild Man Duggan, and then I evolved into Hacksaw. So out of 40-plus years, probably 36, I've been Hacksaw. We just so appreciate all the memories, all the road stories. I know you have WrestleCon coming up, so before we let you get back to the autograph area, anything else that you want to uh, plug and promote? Because I will be there at WrestleCon in oh LA, yeah. and I'll see well, you there. Actually, we got a, quite a tour. We just started here. Me and my wife we flew here. We said we're going to spend a week. We go back to Boston. We're going to spend a week in Boston. I have a wrestling show with Teal Piper, Roddy Piper's daughter. Yes, another uh, second generation. Yeah, yeah. D Piper's there. And then we're flying to Phoenix, where I'm doing my stand-up show. Then to Los Angeles or Las Vegas to do the stand-up show, and then out to Los Angeles for WrestleCon. Wow. But then the big one, our 34th anniversary, we're going to Tahiti. Wow! Yes, round of applause. I better give her a prize after 34 years. 34 years deserves all the applause, and you deserve all the applause for your amazing career and being just one of the best people in the business, one of the nicest and sweetest. So please show your appreciation for Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Oh! Thank Aberdeen, you, folks. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thanks for coming out. And enjoy Comic-Con. Yeah. Keep it going for Hacksaw Jim Duggan, everybody.